Grace and peace are yours from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The text of our sermon this morning is the gospel lesson appointed for this Sunday. It's from Matthew chapter 14. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place. It's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up twelve baskets full of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about five thousand men, besides women and children. This is the gospel of our Lord. What would it take for you to be fully completely 100% confident in Jesus' promises to you. To trust and not doubt. Before we answer that for ourselves, let's try to answer it for Jesus' disciples. What would it take for Jesus' disciples to have that 100% confidence in Jesus? Well, think about what Jesus showed them. When he called them to follow him, he said, I will make you fishers of men. And they began to witness Jesus do ministry. And and they saw the huge crowds flock to Jesus because he taught with authority, not like the other teachers they had. And then they began to witness all of the miracles that Jesus performed. You know some of them. Jesus changed the water into wine. Jesus cleansed people who had leprosy, and the disciples were eyewitnesses of that. They saw Jesus calm the storm in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. With just his words, be still. They saw Jesus run into two men who were possessed by evil spirits, and they were so violent, so dangerous, that nobody could approach them. But the Lord came near and drove out those evil spirits. And maybe one of the most amazing ones up to this point was when Jesus went to the home of Jairus and raised his daughter from the dead. The disciples saw this dead girl who got up and was returned to her parents. Maybe a better question would be, what else does Jesus have to do for these guys to trust him? We can look at the disciples and and sometimes uh, become a little bit proud We haven't seen with our own eyes, yet we believe. As Jesus told Thomas a week after Easter, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's us. But yet there can be a longing. There can be a desire for a little bit more. uh, Another something from Jesus to to give us more confidence. There can be a, a neglect of the things that he does give us in his word and his sacraments. We forget just how amazing it is that God would speak to our hearts with a message of peace and love. But that's exactly what he's doing this morning. As we gather around the word and cover this very familiar miracle of Jesus of feeding the 5,000, the Lord is calling us, calling us to trust him. As he puts on full display before us his mercy and his power. This was a difficult time for Jesus, a very difficult day, we could say. Jesus just heard some bad news. And Jesus, as the Lord of all, his Son of God, he knew exactly what had happened, but somebody came and told him that John the Baptist was dead. John the Baptist was one of the central figures in God's plan of salvation. He's the one that really ushered in the change from Old Testament prophet to the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John and Jesus were relatives. They were partners in God's plan of salvation. 
Jesus himself, who is the author of the Bible, prophesied about John in the Old Testament when he said, See, I'm going to send my messenger ahead of me. He'll prepare the way before me. And John knew his role. John preached to the people and directed them to Jesus. John understood he would become less and Jesus would become greater. These two partners in God's plan of salvation. And now John is dead. And not just dead, he was murdered by King Herod. How would you react? When we get that kind of news, we want to be alone. We want to step back for a little bit, and we've all done that, right? We've, we've taken a drive, we've gone to that quiet place where we can just be by ourselves or with our circle of friends. And that's what Jesus wanted to do with his disciples. Let's get away. Let's go to this place. Maybe they've been there before. Let's spend some time in prayer. Let's mourn the death of John. Ask God for comfort that he gives. Let's get away. So they got into the boat and left. But Jesus was a celebrity. Jesus didn't just sneak away from the crowds. They watched him and they followed him. And you can kind of picture this. Jesus and the disciples set out into the boat, maybe not far from shore, and the crowds that were there saw them leaving, and so they start to follow the boat. They're walking along the shore. Jesus is trying to get away with his disciples. Jesus wants some time alone. Those crowds want more of Jesus. And they get to the spot or they're going to land the boat, and there the crowd is waiting. Do the disciples encourage Jesus and say, hey, why don't we go back out for a little bit of a cruise? Maybe we need some time away from this. Jesus landed. Jesus went on shore. He ministered to the people. This miracle is one that's recorded in all four Gospels. Every Gospel writer records the feeding of the 5,000. And so as you look at those different accounts, you get information about what was happening that day. And the other Gospels tell us that Jesus saw that crowd and had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Those people may have wanted more miracles. They may have just wanted to be a part of the crowd. But Jesus knew what they really needed. They needed to know their Savior. And so he got out of that boat, he went back on shore, and he taught the people. He healed them. Jesus took time, because he's merciful. He recognized the need of those people, and he was the one to fill it. Not just with a a short devotional thought, you know, a little prayer, but the whole day, healing the people and teaching them. Compare that to how we react when we're inconvenienced. When when somebody has us go out of our way because we want to be alone. We want to do what we plan to do. Sometimes we choose ourselves. Not our Savior. His mercy is, is on full display in this account as he sees those people and he goes to meet the needs of those people the same way he does with us. Jesus fully meets our needs. His mercy calls to us to trust in him, and we know so much about his mercy. Mercy that came into this world while we were still sinners. Not because of anything we had done, not because of anything in us, but because he simply wanted us to be in heaven with him forever. And he made sure that we not only heard that message, but he also worked through that message to change our hearts. He used the word and the sacrament of baptism to adopt us into his family of believers because he's merciful. When you see Jesus minister to those people, when you think about your own relationship with him and understand the same Lord who called to those people is calling to you on a regular basis, that builds trust. That's exactly how God wants to build our trust, to lead us to completely rely on him because he's met every need we have fully with his death and resurrection. The disciples should have got that. They should have understood. They should have known that that Jesus has all kinds of power and, and this was a great day to have it on display. Not only did the disciples witness Jesus' miracles, 
they also performed miracles in Jesus' name. Earlier in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus sent these disciples out on their first mission trip, and he gave them authority over evil spirits, and they were able to, to heal people. And they preached the gospel. And when they returned, they couldn't help but telling Jesus all that had happened. Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. This message of the gospel, it really works. They saw Jesus' power. They were people who used that power. To me, it seems quite logical that at the end of this day of Jesus' teaching and healing people, the disciples would have come to Jesus and said, Lord, there's a problem. Can you help us? That's not what they did. Jesus spent the day teaching and healing, and the disciples recognized the problem. It's the end of the day. Nobody's eaten today. There's no food here. Jesus, send these people away so they can go and buy some food. Disciples recognized the problem, and they had the solution. Lord, this is what you need to do. You need to send these people away. And they must have spent some time thinking about this and, and maybe even anticipating what Jesus would say to them. He said, you give them something to eat. Okay, we just got five loaves that we've been able to scrounge up and two fish. How far will these go among such a crowd? Disciples had seen everything. Every possible miracle, they had witnessed it. And now... They didn't trust. Jesus is ready to act. He says, give it to me. Give me what you got. 15,000, 20,000 people gathered that day. Jesus took those five loaves and those two fish. He looked up to heaven and he gave thanks and started passing it out. There are other miracles like this in the Bible where God provides food for people when they're hungry. You think of the Old Testament, right? Every day the people went out and picked up manna that was on the ground or the quail that came into the camp at night. The prophet Elijah and the prophet Elisha both uh, had those experiences when they were staying with people or they were helping people where food did not run out. At the wedding at Cana, when the water was turned into wine, what a, what a great miracle. But this is, is different. This is different because the disciples saw what, where Jesus started. Five loaves and two fish. And you've got to try to picture this. Here Jesus is. Does he have a little table set up like that? Or, or what, you know, what's going on? But as suddenly food is multiplying. For 20,000 people. On an Easter Sunday morning, maybe we feed... 200 people. Have you seen how much food is brought into our gymnasium to feed 200 people? 15,000 people. How many trucks have to back up here to feed that many people? But everybody eats and are completely satisfied. Amazing power that was before the people. And even more. After everybody ate and were satisfied, the disciples went out because you don't leave any leftovers. Everybody knows that. And they picked up the basketfuls of, empty, or of, of leftover bread and fish, and each disciple had their own basket. Twelve baskets, one for each of those guys who told the crowd to go away. They walked away from that miracle with a great visual aid of Jesus' power. Carried it with them. When we see problems in our life, in our world, in our congregation, in our workplace, we're often very good at identifying them and, and highlighting them for other people. Here's the problem. We often bring those problems to the Lord, and we're also really good at offering solutions to those problems. Lord, this is what I think you ought to do. It's why it makes sense. We certainly want to use the, the God-given reason that we have, guided by his word. We don't say, here's the problem, okay, Lord, what are you going to do about it? 
we want to work hard at things. God gives us abilities, and we ought to use them. But Jesus is calling us to trust his power, not our own ideas about what he should do, what we want him to do. Jesus has to remind us of that. And the way that he reminds us that his power is, is chief, that his power is the one we look to and not our own, is by reminding us of the relationship and what we bring to it. We bring our sin, and that should separate us from God. But Jesus chose to redeem us. He chose to bring us into his family of believers. He chose us to show mercy to us. And when we're reminded of that loving relationship that our Savior has established with us, that's exactly the way that he builds our trust in his power, that he will do for us as he's always done for his people. Take care of us. Because we know that even if we have every physical need met, if we have everything we could ever want in life, but we don't have Jesus, we've lost. We know that because we have Jesus, we can lose it all. Take our life, whatever it might be, the kingdom's ours forever. We know that and we believe that and, and we understand that it's only by the power of God that we have that relationship with us. And so we look around in our life and we can see those baskets that we're carrying around of evidence of God's blessing upon us. The children we, we hold in our, our arms, the spouses that we're married to, the blessings that God gives us on a day-to-day -day basis. And even if we're in need, even if we've lost everything, we had a member of our congregation lose it all this week. We still know that our Redeemer lives. And that in the end, we'll stand upon the earth with our own eyes. We will see Jesus. That's the power of the gospel. The power that God uses to strengthen us in the faith, to build our trust in him. This week, as I was preparing this sermon, I realized that this is the first time I've ever preached a sermon on Jesus feeding the 5,000. In, in 20 years, I had never preached on this text before. Every time it comes up in the church here, I think I've always looked at it and said, everybody knows this already, because you've learned it in Sunday school, right? You, you know what happens with the disciples, know about the five loaves and two fish, and how many people are fed. What new information can you get out of it? I, this is my sermon for the week. I said, I'm... 20 years, I guess I better preach feeding the 5,000, right? You've got to go through your ministry and do it at least once. But it just struck me again how God's word is new every morning. Now you go into a section of scripture that, of course you know it. Most people here could probably teach a Bible study or a, a Sunday school lesson on the feeding of the 5,000 and get the major points, right? But something really neat happens when you're in the word, even when it's a really familiar word of God. Holy Spirit is working. The Holy Spirit is working through that word in our hearts to remind us of why we need Jesus' mercy and how amazing that a mercy is. Even a very familiar section of scripture. The power of God that was on display for those disciples and is still in our hearts and in our lives today. Always working. Always working to build in us a trust. So we don't really have to ask, what else do we need to see? Or Jesus, what else are you going to do? God's word shows us what he's done and what that delivers to us every single day of our life in his word and in the sacrament. The forgiveness of sins and the promise of eternal life in heaven. That mercy and that power is, and may God grant, will always be the way that our Savior continues to call us to trust him. Amen.